The Ozo 9 Equalizer is perhaps its hidden weapon because it is a really good equalizer plugin in its own right, but because it's overshadowed by the other modules, a lot of people don't maybe consider it for usage during mixing. Now, if you have the advanced version of Ozo 9, you can use it in its own separate equalizer module, or if you had the standard version, you can just load it up in the Ozo 9 Mothership plugin. As I've done in the other Ozo 9 tutorials, to make things simple, I'm gonna start in the upper left corner, so we can rename this if you have other Isotope plugins. Typically, I just keep it on EQ. And then over here, we have presets. So we can quickly get started just by cycling through these. We can either click the names or go up and down with the keyboard arrows. And just like the other Ozone 9 modules, we have undo, undo history, settings, and open the user manual. So let's actually reset this to the default and go back over here to the left side. We have our view options. The default one is detailed band and the other one opens up the different bands on the bottom. So whichever one you prefer to use, you can have it open like that. For now, I'm gonna keep it on the default view Channel processing mode, we have three different options, stereo, mid-side, or we can divide the controls between the left and right channels. For this tutorial, I'm gonna keep it on stereo. Mid-side allows you to process either the mono signal, which is everything that is straight up the center if you have a pan knob, or the rest of the information that is not the exact same. This is very useful in mastering if you don't want to make, let's say, the vocals brighter, but you do want to make everything else brighter or less bright or less low end or more low end. And if you don't want to have both channels sound the exact same, then choose left and right. To the far right of that is the reset button. So no matter what I do, if I accidentally hit that, It'll go back to normal, and if you do accidentally hit it, just come up here to undo, and you'll go back. On the sides and bottom are our meter scales. To the right is the EQ gain. To the left is our spectrum magnitude, and spectrum frequency is on the bottom. This has to do with, when you play a piece of audio, what you're actually seeing. And if I boost this, then this number right here correlates with the number over here. It's that simple. When you do make an EQ change, a new thing changes, and that is this area right here. It is colored, it's easy to see, it shows what's called the filter response curve. And it represents what you've done to change things. As I add other EQ, you can see right now the node, that's what this little dot is called, the node is shown in blue, but the overall curve is in white. And that white line is called the composite curve. Now, new for version 9.1 is an option called show extra curves. And this allows us to see the phase response, but it also adds a bunch of junk to the screen that you may not want to see. So you can temporarily enable it so you can see these lines down here. It explains it up here and you can enable them and disable them. All right. So we can see the phase response, the phase delay, if there is any, and that's actually a very important thing to visualize. And then finally, the group delay. So the way this works is phase response shows the measurement in degrees. And we can see those numbers over here. When I click it, it goes away. When I put it on, there we go. We can see how things are lining up on a polarity scale. Delay is measured in time. I'd assume that this 
orange flat line is at zero and anything that's slightly changed. So I'll be honest, I really don't know what the difference is between phase delay and group delay. I thought maybe it had to do with the nodes, but it, it doesn't. So I'm going to have to ask Isotope because they don't really explain it well in the manual. All right, I'm going to reset everything now and get rid of the phase options. One thing I didn't talk about, and I don't know how I skipped this by accident, but it's this option right here. This allows us to set the global filter setting to either analog style or digital. Digital is linear phase and analog is minimum phase mode. Now the cool thing with digital is you can actually modify on a per node basis how much phase shift there is. And the way you do that is you select one of your nodes and over here, you click this arrow, which opens up the advanced HUD panel. And then you can choose, okay, linear phase is at zero. And if you go to 100%, it essentially becomes an analog style node. If you want to do somewhere in the middle, 50%, or maybe more towards the analog side, 75%. But, you know, it just gives you this option in case you're concerned about phase issues. And yeah, pretty neat that they've included that. Now, speaking of the HUD, if you don't have it in this mode, you see the HUD, the heads up display. On the upper left corner, we have our bypass, enable or disable. Then we have our solo button, so we can hear what's just going on with this band. We also have something that gets rid of the node. So let's say you don't like what you're hearing, right? All right, hit X. There goes the node. If you want to add the node back, you just click and there it is. In the top center, we can choose our filter shape and there's 13 different ones you can choose from, All right? Very powerful stuff if you get into this. Now, by default, it is on proportional queue, which is an API style of equalization that I personally like, but that's for the nodes that are in the middle. If I choose one of these, by default, it's going to be on a back sandal style shelf filter, which is actually a really good choice. If you have to do a shelf filter, Back sandal is probably the one I would go with nine times out of 10. Now, if you click over in this area, anywhere below 100 Hertz, it'll automatically add a high pass filter. And again, you can choose from all these different options. You can choose the slope. For now, I'm gonna get rid of this. Back to the HUD. Again, proportional Q is a good first choice. We can also have a standard bell. So we'll watch what happens when I change these options. So proportional cue, as you are gaining up or down, the lower the setting, the, the wider it is, but the higher the setting, see how it, it just, and the idea is that if you want to do deep cuts or deep boost, it will get narrower the higher you get. If I had this set to a standard bell curve, it stays the same cue all throughout. Now the neat thing is I can actually choose my bandwidth setting. So if I want to have a very narrow bandwidth, I can choose that. And then once I adjust the option, it'll stay that way. So it goes beyond what an API equalizer can do. Although, in my opinion, API equalizers are tuned very well to sound musical, but also to be used as a utility. So I should mention, to move the nodes around, you can actually just click on the circle, move it left, right, up and down. When you go left and right, it changes the frequency. When you go up and down, it changes the gain. Now, the other neat thing is if you have a scroll wheel on your mouse, you can just adjust that and it changes the cue or the bandwidth. 
Now, you have to remember, gain is limited to plus 6 decibels or minus 10 decibels if you choose to use it with the mouse. But you can change it to go higher if you click on the number or if you double click on it and enter a value manually. And if you do it that way, it goes all the way up to 15 decibels on the positive side and minus 30 decibels on the negative side. One of my favorite features is the Alt Solo option. So you have to actually press the Alt key on your keyboard and then click the node. And when you do that, it actually solos what you're doing for that portion of your equalizer. And while you're adjusting this, you can change it to a different frequency. You can also change the Q using your mouse scroll wheel. And again, up and down for gain changes. I'm holding the Alt key while I'm doing this, and it works very well. Let's play some audio so you can hear what I'm doing. From the bleeding brain. There's still a bug in Ozone 9 where as I'm adjusting the Q, you can't hear it. But normally when I'm doing that, it would actually expand the range of the Alt Solo. At least it does adjust based on gain and frequency. If you want to update the cue, just move it over a little bit. All right, let's go back to the filter shapes because I didn't finish explaining what they all are. So there are three main categories. We have peak, and this allows you to specify a boost or cut at a given frequency. And for some reason, they change it from peak to bell. So bell it is. Our second category is shelf. And basically, these are like the ones that you have on your car stereo or your hi-fi stereo. It allows us to choose a frequency, and at that point, all others past that frequency will either be cut or boosted. A low shelf filter is for our bass range, so everything to the left of the setting will be boost or cut. And a high shelf is the opposite, so everything past that point will be boosted or cut to the right. So let me show that again. Here's a low shelf. And I'll actually cut it. And here's a high shelf. Again, once you start messing with these different types of EQs, it becomes second nature to you. But for the newbies out there, I wanted to kind of explain what they did. Our third and final category of EQ filter shapes, the pass. Essentially, you set your frequency and then depending on if you're using a low pass or high pass filter, your audio is cut. Now, depending on the slope setting, which I'll show you all right now, let me reset this again. So if I choose this, right now that's a very steep slope. Now. If you grab the left side next to the circle right here, it actually lets you change it from 6 decibels per octave, 12 decibels per octave, all the way up to 48, which is very, very steep. Typically, I would go with either 6 or 12 decibels, usually 12 decibels. So let's say that I have this all the way over here. Well, we're not going to hear a lot of frequencies. Check it out. And that's our high pass filter. Right now it's on the flat high pass. We can also choose resonant, which when you do that, it actually peaks the audio a little bit before the cut. Or we can also choose a brick wall so that the slope is super, super, super steep. But this doesn't sound that natural. but it's there if we want to use it. Now, if we chose low pass, that lets everything before this setting come through. 
And again, just like with the other one, we can choose the slope. This comes in handy on like bass guitars, regular electric guitars, and anything that doesn't really have a lot of high-end frequency energy. A kick drum is another example. So those three instruments, I'll usually use a low-pass filter on to some extent. Also, some people who know that they're going to encode something in the past, they would limit their frequencies to around 16 or 18 kilohertz. I never was a fan of that, but some people like to do it anyway, so they have control over the way it sounds. But then eventually they included low pass filters while you're encoding, so there was really no point in doing it. But anyway, that's besides the point. Let's go on to some more options we have. I should mention, although it does say flat low pass or flat high pass, it is a Butterworth design, which is my favorite type to use for this task. Brick wall is an elliptic design, so it's steep, but it has minimal signal ripple. Typically you'll see it in vinyl mastering. Another cool tip I'll give Basically, if you press shift first and then drag left and right, it will lock your gain into place. And what I would do is let go of the mouse click and then let go of shift after that. Or if you go up and down, you can hold shift, drag up and down. It doesn't change the frequency. Even if I move my mouse all the way over here, the frequency stays the same. And the other option, again, let, let go of the mouse button first and then let go of shift the last thing you can do that they just added into version 9.1, as I said earlier, was you can actually adjust these numbers up and down right on the hood. So very, very useful. I'm glad they added that feature in. If you want to reset an individual band instead of resetting everything, like let's say you already EQ'd a bunch of things and you're like, oh man, I don't like, I don't like the way this sounds. Just double click it. And it resets. All right, now finally, I'm going to talk about our settings. So come up here to the gear icon, click on that, and then come over here to the equalizer tab. First of all, we have the alt solo filter, which is the default setting. We can have it on three, we can have it up to 12, all the way down to 0 0.2. So three is the default. And again, they just added the phase options that you can add to the spectrum. Soft saturation uses a little bit more CPU, but it has a more analog type of clipping if you go too far. And then our last two options, buffer size. This is how many samples are stored in the memory buffer. If you're having issues with clicking or popping, it may help to change this option. Frequency resolution. Now this one's interesting. It is the minimum that the EQ can be adjusted. By default, it's on 12, but if you want even finer resolution, which will use a little bit more CPU potentially, use a lower number. And from my understanding, the lower the number, the more CPU the equalizer uses. So yes, if you want the finest resolution, then set it on a very low number. And as you can see, the filter size, which indicates the kernel length when you're in digital mode, choose the lowest number. It doesn't seem like it takes up that much more CPU, but I might be wrong about that.